Hello and welcome. I'm Taylor Pearson, and this is the Mutiny Podcast. This podcast is an open-ended exploration of topics relating to growing and preserving your wealth, including investing, markets, decision-making under opacity, risk, volatility, and complexity. In this episode, I'm joined by Mutiny Fund CIO Jason Buck and a close partner at RCM Alternatives, Jeff Malik. In this quarterly review, we discuss what we saw in volatility markets in Q4 2020 and how various volatility strategies performed and what we might expect to see looking into 2021. We go into some stuff around the VIX term structure, particularly around the election, the impact of retail call buying, and the general dislocation of the normal relationship between volatility and equities. In addition to our conversation, Jason also sat down with Bastian Balestia from Deepfield Capital, which employs volatility arbitrage and short-term trend-following models, as well as Wayne Himmelsheim from Logica Funds, which focuses on long option strategies for their takes on the market in Q4. To give a bit of context, Q4 saw the S&P up about 10.9% and the VIX down about negative 14%, though it was mostly range bound between 20 and 25 with one spike at the end of October. So without any further ado, I hope you enjoy these conversations. So let's start with October. What was the what was going on in October in volatility markets and um, how did that sort of play out? Well, I guess I'll start with kind of just a, a general overview of October. And what you had at the beginning of October going you know, through October 12th is you had volatility just got crushed back down. As the S&P rose about 5%, um, volatility got absolutely hammered by mid-month. And, and so that was obviously a, a, a difficult environment for a long volatility fund in general or a lot of long volatility strategies. As we got towards the very end of October, those last few days in October that last week, you saw a massive uh, volatility spike as, as S&P crushed back down a little bit. And most of our managers, we were able to capture that volatility spike, except for the last few days um, in October, it, it got chopped back down. So it was it was a kind of a, a three part tale, uh, volatility crushed through mid month, um, the last week of the month. You know, volatility spiked. We captured it, and then you had a big pullback in the last few days, and it chopped around where you were able to lose a bit. So in, in essence, long volatility strategies in general were down mid month, up towards the end of the month, and then back down a little bit. And that's kind of the the general story of October. So yeah, what was weird to me in October was you saw this big disconnection between the print in the VIX, which everyone uses as a easy proxy for volatility, and the actual volatility itself inside the market, uh, be it fixed strike vols or front month versus back month VIX uh, curve. You know, those, those levels were up either next to nothing or small single digits while you saw the VIX print up 40 some percent. Uh, so that was a big disconnect. And the, of course, the things the uh, strategies that we employ can actually trade are the actual futures and the actual options, not the VIX itself. It's not tradable. Uh, so that was a little bit of an odd odd disconnect there in October. Yeah, maybe to put some numbers on that, the, the VIX itself uh, was up 39% in October. The VIX, S&P 500 VIX front month futures uh, index, which is an index of the actual tradable instruments was up about seven and a half percent. So just a big difference between the nominal number and what the tradable instruments did. And that's maybe we could, I'll piggyback on that, but it's maybe something to highlight. I think in in risk on times or normal times, if we if we discount twenty twenty, um, a lot of times if you're just looking at the VIX index number, um, especially in points versus percentage, it gives you a good idea of where volatility is trading or volatility spikes or declines. The issue is um, when we have twenty twenty and you had a a sell off in March and you have that echo of volatility in the markets. Um, and then we have the the term structure matters a lot more in the actual tradable VIX market. So the VIX index is non-tradable. You have to trade the futures or options on futures to actually trade the VIX. And that's where term structure then matters, where you can have a, a spike in the actual non-tradable VIX number, but that doesn't subsequently uh, realize in the actual VIX futures. And, and especially in this scenario in October is because we had the, the November 3rd election. And so there's an interesting kink in the term structure around October, November, December contract 
contracts about uh, unknown uh, election volatility that was giving you both uh, high contango and backwardation right around the uh, the election cycle. Right, and just to define be- that quickly, we do have an article on the site for uh, what is the fix in contango and backwardation. But uh, to expand on what Jason was saying, you know, typically in quote unquote normal times, you have the f- the fr- front month is lower volatility, and then you have sort of uh, uh, increasing as you go out further months. The sort of um, the VIX futures goes up, and there was a weird kink in the curve where it went up a lot right around the 2020 election uh, in the U.S. and then sort of dropped back down. So it was a it wasn't the shape of the futures curve was very different from what it, it typically would be. And so to and to Taylor's point is then if you're putting on a trade, uh, let's say a pairs trade on a on the calendar of the VIX, you're going long that front month because you need to be long volatility, but then you're fighting against that contango curve. So you're losing on that position and then you're hedging it out with the back month, you're going short that volatility, and now it's in backwardation. So you're fighting that as well. So you're getting hit on both sides while you're trying to create a, a paired uh, trade to be market neutral or, or long volatility, you're getting beat up on both sides when you have a kink like that in the curve yeah and another uh, i was just about to say similar thing of you know just assume you're going to try and capture that ball spike um but you're worried about the high level of vix now you might go long in the back months um and either have neutral in the front months or short in the front months uh and in this case it spiked somewhat in the front months but the back months barely moved or didn't move at all because they were pinned to that election as jason's saying and then I'll just uh, another point. There was October was, as we noted, was super uh, volatile, not just for the VIX but for the market itself. It was on either side of even. Uh, a couple days, it seemed like okay, the the election is going to be a big problem. Um, people forecasting what turned out didn't happen till uh, just recently here in January, but uh, that caused a lot of days where you'd come in. You know, U.S. traders would come in. The market's down. By the end of the day, it closes at even or break even uh, and vice versa. So for our short term future strategies uh, that are trying to capture those small moves, if they're getting in on the beginning of the day when it's down and it retraces higher by midday or the end of the day uh, is problematic for those. They're going to lose a little bit. And then what about November? What kind of what was happening in the market in November and how did sort of long volatility strategies perform? And to me, November, as weird as October was, um, you know, vol of vol was high and it was just a weird month. I think November was a return to normal in terms of the correlations between the equity markets and volatility. Um, that was a bad thing to be long vol because the equ- equity markets screamed higher. But, you know, as a normal, hey, we're, we're buying vol in all of its different forms and the market screamed higher and volatility got crushed. You know, everyone was expecting big fireworks out of the election, and it turned out to be sort of a non-event, and volatility reacted as such. Yeah, and as Jeff saying, as that volatility uh, drifts or crushes back down after the non, you know, non-event with the election, that that makes any sort of long volatility. Um, strategy struggle, whether that's playing VIX or the, your long options or, or in the futures contracts as well. Um, not a lot going on there that you can really take advantage of. Um, the interesting thing towards the end of November and going into December, that's when we started to see um, implied volatility staying up in that you know low 20-ish range um, and just kind of drifting around back and forth in the low 20s. But then um, going into uh, ended in November into December, we started to see realized volatility crushing back down into the single digits. And so you kind of have this dispersion between um, Implied volatility staying pinned and and realized volatility crushing back down. And, you know, most of our managers or our long volatility managers are taking advantage of when realized volatility spikes. So if it's, you know, crushing back down versus implied, um, it's a little bit more of a headwind. But also, um, as Jeff was alluding to, we started to see at least the correlations coming back into line, which are uh, present in, in normal normal market environments. And I'll, I'll throw some little bit of mini shade on some of our managers of I we would have hoped to have done better in November, you know, in the single name volatilities were increasing, right? You saw some huge moves in single name equities. Um, and, you know, the, the structure is such that you can capture both sides of volatility in a 99 melt up type event and in a, you know, 2008 type crash. So one month doesn't make a 99 melt up, but, um, you know, just 
was a little disappointing or uh, wish we'd seen a little better performance there. Part of their reasoning was it was not in the uh, names it was expected to be. There was a bit of a shift to value stocks in November from momentum stocks, like a, a once in a lifetime shift. I think one of the days had a uh, and people get mad at throwing around standard deviations like this, but like a 20 standard dev- deviation move or so. Yeah, we haven't seen to Jeff's alluding to the 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 vaccine day, right? Like the vaccine announcement spike, and we haven't seen a rotation that violently from from momentum to value since 1983, I believe. So um, it gives you an idea, like if if our uh, right tail or 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 an option or long volatility manager is looking at the right tail of of the S and P or other indices spiking, and they were on the indices side. You didn't see that subsequent spike on indices side. You saw it more spiking on individual stock names, like in value names, as Jeff was alluding to. The other story that he was also alluding to is is the Robinhood trader, the Wall Street bets, um, in massive call buying from uh, from retail traders, and it's a great story, a very interesting story, and how those retail traders were able to kind of catch the uh, the market made and the dealers off sides. And by them having to hedge their position, it forced the markets higher and moved towards those those deltas and those strikes that those uh, Robin Hood and Wall Street Bets retail buyers were, were buying. And so that was an interesting kind of move to the upside as well in single names, uh, especially tech names, um, especially Tesla, for example. Um, and what's interesting about that is that you can catch those dealers offside and 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 do really well as a retail trader in those environments. But the next time that happens, the dealers are going to bid up those implied volatilities, and it's going to be prohibitively difficult for for retail to pull that off on, on a second or third time. Yeah, I was just going to say you don't read too many articles about hugely successful hedge fund managers who followed retail right into a trade. So yes, those trades have worked out, but A, they're making the calls more expensive to buy, uh, which makes it more difficult to position to capture that upside volatility, that right tail. Um, but B, yeah, it's it's just not an over, you know, a long-term winning strategy to be buying huge, you know, two week out of the money calls, hoping Tesla goes up 50% in two weeks. And we don't need to go into the details, but maybe to touch on the just the general mechanics there, if that's not intuitive, right? When the retail people on op, Robin Hood or wherever are coming in and buying um, short data call options that are 10 or 20% of the money, whatever it is, that's forcing the option dealers to go long the stock because since they just sold that option, so they have to hedge it out. So when you know, they go along the stock, it forces the stock price up and you can get this kind of somewhat reflexive uh, feedback loop. And that was probably a part of the market dynamic that we saw in November yeah, I, and just in general last year. I, I'd sum it up of there's not a perfect supply of retail option sellers to retail option buyers. It's 10 to one on the buying side. So firms like Citadel and big, huge market maker firms, Susquehanna, they step in and say, we'll sell you these options. Uh, They're super smart. So they'll sell you the option, but they don't want risks that Tesla increases 50%. So they'll buy what they call Delta hedging. They'll buy some of the stock to hedge that. When they first sell you the option, they only have to buy say 20% of the, the exposure. As the stock gets closer and closer to your strike price, they have to keep buying more and more to get perfectly hedged. So that causes this uh, gamma squeeze where the closer you get to the strike, the more stock those market makers have to purchase in order to be perfectly hedged and just take your money on the spread they gave you on the option instead of they don't want to take any directional risk. They just want to uh, lock in the spread they offer you on the option. And then uh, on the other side of that, as you reach the expiration of that option, that gamma rolls off, they're going to roll those off their books and can you can have a violent turn the other direction as well. If It, it just depends on where the, where the positioning is. Yeah. And I mean, this is, is going to be a continuing theme in these markets, probably throughout 2021. Um, we could spend three hours on here talking through it, but I'd say we'll, we'll put some links to some good resources on learning about that. Great. And then let's talk about uh, December, sort of same question. What, what was happening in the market in December and how did sort of long volatility strategies react to it? I'll just say December was, again, a, a return to normal. You didn't have the huge um, equity rally. You didn't have a huge sell-off in vol. Um, the main story was vol continuing to be pinned and uh, implied vols staying well above realized vols. Uh, I think we wrote a poster. It's coming of, of you know, the implied vol is kind of what you want to pay and the realized vol is what you're going to get. And for several months now, that implied has been well above what you're getting out of the market. 
Yeah, I think Jeff beat me to it. I was going to say a return to normalist Dan. So in return to normality um, in markets. I mean, you still had the S and P, you know, grinding higher in general uh, through the end of the year. Um, but I think what's more interesting, maybe anecdotally, is we're seeing. Um, a lot of players starting to regross their books. Um, and so, you know, what we talked about a lot in March was this degrossing or deleveraging of books when everybody's got to, you know, if they have a vol targeted fund and they have to, re- you know, volatility spikes, they have to reduce their leverage. And that creates a cascade of selling effects that we saw in March. Um, we're seeing kind of the opposite now. We're getting in December because the, maybe those look backs are shorter for a lot of managers. So as volatility has been coming back down, especially realized volatility, they're starting to regross. And, and le- re-lever up a lot of their positions. And uh, we're starting to see that from some big players anecdotally in the market in December and moving into to the beginning of the year. Uh, a- another interesting thing in December is you saw gold rally um, pretty big. So I think that was a return to normal correlations as well. You had gold down pretty big September through November. Uh, and some of these managers that we employ use gold as a, a proxy, uh, whether they're buying options on gold or you know, long positions in gold, that can be a cheaper proxy than buying uh, puts on the S&P or even the VIX term structure when it's pinned artificially high, like we've seen. Some of the managers can go into some proxy markets and those proxies weren't behaving as they'd be expected to behave September through November. If we think about, not really month to month, but if we think about Q4 in general, um, and, and we saw towards the end of uh, Q3 at that Jeff was alluding to as well. It's like in September, October, you had basically kind of all strategies struggle. So I'm just thinking about things in, in time sequences or temper or temporality. So if you think about like a permanent portfolio where you have all the world's assets or risk parity, et cetera, um, everything was kind of down in September, October, of course, except for Bitcoin. And I don't want to let's let's set aside Bitcoin for a second. But you had um, basically almost all strategies, all markets, all cl- asset class were down in September, October. And so if you take anything in isolation over over a few months or a, or a quarter, um, you're going to have down months. That's an inevitability of investments. So it's it's more about looking at the the long run of history. You know how how things perform. And and once again, we always think about long volatility tail risk options as as a hedge or a ballast. Um, to a TWA long S and P portfolio, but you can have times where the the S and P is slightly down and, and long volatility and tail risk are slightly down as well, and that's just you know part of of having things that are negatively correlated yet not perfectly negatively correlated right from that at the money starting point. And I think just zooming out a little bit from from just Q four, but you know sort of the at least in the volatility landscape, part of the macro backdrop was the drop from you know the VIX drop from. Uh, you know, 80s in late March to, you know, it dipped below 20 briefly in November. So that's that's the fastest vol crush of that level um, since the VIX started in, in 1990. So not, yeah, an, an unusual or a, an atypical year in that sense. And you've seen an S&P rally of over 70% from, from the bottom. I mean, that's just phenomenal. And as we've touched on before, the last time we were at all-time highs, VIX was at 14 or something. You know, now it's seemingly pinned at 20 to 25. Um, Yeah, excellent point. Every time, on average, we've seen S&P highs, VIX has been at 14, as Jeff said. Um, The last time we've seen um, both S&P at highs and and VIX up was was 1999. We're not saying we're exactly in that environment, but uh, it's it's always a rare occurrence and unusual to have um, S&P making all-time highs at a higher VIX point. Yeah. And if you took the whole year, right, the perfect trade would have been, I'm going to sell volatility and have some super cheap, way out of the money calls on the VIX or or puts on the S&P, right? Um, so I'm going to collect all that premium, sell all that volatility, and then I'm going to protect myself against that that huge spike. So this was the poster child for that that type of strategy. But long term, that's not necessarily a winning strategy um, because there's tons of miniature spikes Right, that are not going to go get those way far out of the money puts or VIX calls that you've purchased um, that can just grind you down. You're saying you don't have a time machine and a hindsight look back machine for us to be able to trade in reverse? I've, I've long decided, I'm like, would I do that trade or just buy tons of Tesla calls? Probably the latter. And what sort of in a big picture, any thoughts about, you know, Q4 as a whole or 2020 as a whole? 
I think Q4, we were able to to learn a lot about all the long volatility and option strategies. I thought it, it taught us a lot about um, where they could potentially break down when correlations break a little bit, um, when you have this echo of volatility combined with an unusual election event, you know, when you kind of, and then, you know, COVID uncertainty, you know, uh, vaccine announcement. We saw, we got to see a lot, um, you know, as your Tolstoy quote about, you know, a, a lot of things, you know, there's decades where nothing happens and, 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 yeah, I'm going to get that one wrong. One wrong. So Taylor, you can. Um, yeah, it's actually Vladimir Lenin, which is kind of weird to quote a Russian dictator. But uh, <laughs> there are decades in which nothing happens, and weeks in which decades happen. So 2020 seemed like one of those years where there were a lot of a lot of weeks in which decades seemed to happen. Yeah, and I think that you know, at the end of the day, all of us hate drawdowns, no matter who we are. And but drawdowns are part of any uh, investment portfolio or any investment strategy. And you know, learning a lot is underrated and overrated. Um, and so, uh, we, we constantly get feedback and we get to constantly iterate. And that's part of the, uh, the red queen principle of staying in, in long volatility markets is we always have to run faster and faster to, to hopefully stay in the same place. And I think the big, the big thing to me was the, um, how do you want to position your protection, right? So a naive protection might just protect against that initial spike down, grab the money, call it a day. Um, you know, mutiny's designed to capture multiple legs of a down move. So if the if the second, if the third, if the fourth leg never happens, that's going to cost cost money because you're setting up the protection in order to protect against that. In in retrospect, right, there was no huge blow up during the election. There was, you know, against all odds in this raging pandemic and the economy shut down, the markets at all time highs. Um, those could have just as easily been. I think we can all imagine a universe where. An alternate reality where, you know, we took another leg down. We were down 60, 70, 80 percent in stock indices um, with with this pandemic and with a contested election. So the the job is to protect all the legs down. Um, it, it When you sit here in Monday morning quarterback, you can say, ah, oh, if we if we'd taken off those second, third, fourth leg protections, we would have made a lot more money. But we don't have the time machine. Yeah, and I think that sort of underscores just, you know, as we talk about all the time, like the importance of ensembles and diversification, right? You know, without without having a time machine for what the future looks like, you know, uh, a diversified portfolio of long volatility assets combined with a diversified portfolio of short volatility assets in 2020, uh, you know, still did, still did well. So you have to look at it in that sort of holistic way. Yeah, and I think, to, I think the point is, too, that our, the long volatility mandate is to remain long vol and have that pro- protection no matter how fierce the headwinds are. And that's what it's there for. And no matter how fierce the headwinds are, we still have to maintain that exposure in case there is that second or third leg down. And, you know, I think we're, I don't know if I want to hint at this, but moving from Q4 into, into 2021, I mean, if you would have told me a couple of years ago that you could be running a long volatility book and people would storm the capital and, and volatility would stay flat. I mean, this is just part of the, uh, the crazy markets that we all get to experience. <laughs> Yeah, no comment there, right? Like that's un- unbelievable. You could have made a lot of money selling, right? People like, I'll bet you Vol doesn't move. I'll bet you fifty to one Vol doesn't move when there's a uh, storming of the cap. So, looking ahead to twenty twenty one, anyone have what uh what are the thoughts? What is the what do things look like for twenty twenty one? I mean, to me, with these markets back at all time highs, you're you know you're kind of right back where you were Jan of of twenty and Jan of twenty eighteen. Um, and there's, there's tons of potential for dislocation and, and a lot of action in the volatility space. I think personally, I think, you know, we've come through a lot of the pain of that dislocation in, in vol markets. Uh, there's gotta be a coming to Jesus moment of implied versus realized. One of those two is going to move and meet the other. Um, yeah, and that's it. But I think we've we've seen that return to a more normal correlation between the two. That can only help uh, most strategies that we're we're looking at. So I'm excited. And like, as Jeff said, the, those correlations coming back into line, but also um, not quite the same maybe as January 2020, where you know maybe we had vol down in the into the teens, implied vol in the teens, and now we're in the the low 20s. So not gonna, not quite that 
uh, huge convexity that we're sitting on, but still we like to see it back down here. So that way our managers are able to reload and, and long volatility and tail risk um, is in a good position moving forward. And as always, we, we don't know when the next crash is going to come, but we always want to be positioned for it. And so we're looking at a, a great set of positions, you know, moving into the subsequent year. Yeah. And I, I would just add, I think, I don't, I'm not saying there's going to be a crash. I don't think we need a crash. I think the more normal environment is going to result in some more normal uh, abilities to, to do well, whether there's vol spikes or not. I'm Jason Buck from Mutiny Fund, and I'm sitting here with Wayne Himmelsign of Logica. Uh, we're going to do a kind of a Q4 2020 review here to talk a little bit about long volatility and options. I think, think we should start at a high level and talk about, you know, Q4 2020, you know, what are the headwinds when you're running a, a long volatility book? And, and how do you manage environments where you have a very strong headwind, you know, slamming you in the face every day? Yeah, so um, that's the that's the downside of optionality is it, it costs to own, um, and so you talk about a headwind. It's you, you could almost be thought of as a hurdle rate, uh, right? And so you know, with with any you know, we obviously we all have the the very well known hurdle rate, the risk free rate, right? And so you know, if if uh, government bonds of Treasuries were paying were yielding ten percent, paying ten percent, there'd be no reason to buy equities because that's that you you make all your money risk free. Now they're paying down. To zero or a quarter or whatever they are. So now everybody wants to buy equities. So the the, the hurdle for risk has, has, of course, much lower um, for taking risk. Now, take that analog and, and uh, map it over onto optionality is the higher vol is, literally the more expensive expensive an option is. So the price of an option is you can bifurcate into two pieces, the intrinsic and the extrinsic. The intrinsic value of the option is is a is a directly related to the, 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 the underlying, the price of the underlying, where the extrinsic value is all premium. It's and that premium is priced by the the way options are priced, Black Scholes uh, as the as the famous model are priced by volatility. So the higher vo- the volatility, the more expensive that premium. It's that simple, right? Um, and you can think about this in terms of insurance, right? If if you're someone who is less healthy and you uh, tend to go to the hospital more often, then your premiums are higher. <laughs> it's that simple. The more prone you are to accidents, the higher your premiums. So if we think about it in that context, the February March event was a major accident, right? Um, in 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 terms of insurance, like this major event happened, and so now all insurance premiums are expensive. Vol is so much higher that any option you buy, you're starting with a higher premium, and that extrinsic is 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 so uh, inflated that you now have to make potentially not ten, but perhaps 15% a year just to cover that cost of a premium, um, right? And so, can you say, well, let's not buy insurance? In our opinion, no, you can't, because we still don't know when the next event is coming. Uh, if you think back to February, March, you know, it, it, the pandemic started, and I, uh, the, a lot of the chatter around uh, perhaps June, July was the quote second leg down, right? It's coming, and lots of big hedge fund managers and 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 um, you know e- economists and people everywhere. That was the social media discussion. Was the second leg down? So how could you not continue owning? put optionality. You can't, right? So, especially as doing what we do, we're in the business of long volatility for that reason, is you never know when that next thing is coming, whether it was the second leg as a result of the pandemic or whether it was something totally new. I mean, for all we know, there was a complete unrelated event that happened that would have taken place in August, right? We, we that That's the problem with life is you never know. Same way we, you know, everybody was blown out of the water in February when suddenly there was a pandemic. January of 2020, everything was fantastic. So, with this thinking in mind, i.e., that you have to own insurance, but now your your hurdle to own it by that by the val- the pricing of these premiums are so high, now you have to make so much more money just to cover that hurdle. So, as long vol owners, we say, okay, you know, historically, when vol is lower, when the premiums were cheaper, we could trade and do all the things we do to generate profits. That would make money above a, a low hurdle. Let's say our hurdle was five percent. So if we made fifteen percent, well, we covered the five and we were profitable by ten percent. Fantastic. But now, if your hurdle is fifteen, 
If we're generating 15, we're barely scraping the surface that all the money we're making, every little drip of profit is literally just trying to keep us above water. In fact, right below water, right? So, so that we don't sink with a, with a cost of what we're buying. Uh, and again, why do we do it? Because we don't know the next time it'll be needed might be, quote, tomorrow. And so we're in the business of protection. We got to keep on buying. But for, for us, it's, you know, you, you manage that headwind, it'll, you get through it because vol always tends to decay back to normal levels. It already has as of, as of recent. It's, it's back to close enough to historical norms. So it's just this period you kind of have to go through when you're in the business of insuring. Um, and, and therefore we did it. Um, but that's it. I hope that answers your question and I'll ask you if you have any follow ups on that. No, I think that's great. It's it's is if we have this mandate of long volatility and tail risk, you know, you're going to fight that headwind, and and you're just trying to limit that bleed as much as you can, and stay in those positions as long as you can, waiting for the next event to happen, never knowing when it's going to happen, and that's just it's just part of life that we have to deal with, right? And and we're always always trying to have that protection on because nobody ever knows if there's a second or third leg down. If we knew that in hindsight, right, you wouldn't need that protection, but that's not the point to what we do. Well, what's what's even funny about that is if you in, in real life or not in real life in non-market life, <laughs> right? Uh, pe- people would never say that in terms of their other insurance. If I said, hey, you know, drop your car insurance for a month. No, are you kidding? Because like next Tuesday might be that accident or, hey, don't worry about your health insurance this month. Don't don't pay the premiums. You're fine to go without health insurance. Are you kidding me? No, that's that's going to be the weekend you fall down the stairs, right? <laughs> so it's that, that why, why will, is it unacceptable to all of us in health insurance, car insurance, homeowners insurance, but in the markets, we, we're fine to go a few months without insurance. That it, it, it doesn't make sense to me, and I mean that's why I'm in this business. That we are also totally uncomfortable not insuring things around us that that we live our lives with. But people are are, are tend to do it much more often and frequently in, in the capital markets. And then we go if we if we dive kind of into the the different months during Q4, if we look at October, you know, going in from the beginning of October through like October 12th, you know, we had the, the S and P was rising and I believe it was up a little bit over 5% by then and volatility was getting crushed back down, which is part of that headwind that you referred to. But then towards the end of October, um, we had the markets come down and volatility spike back up, but we also have this other headwind of the, the election campaign and, and, a rise in, in volatility in general before the election. So we, we did see a bit of a spike towards the end of October um, in volatility, but it, it, it came on the backs of volatility crush. And then in just before those last few days at the end of October, you know, volatility got crushed back down after the spike and chopped around a little bit. I'm just curious how you guys saw October and in and, and how your models were, were reacting to that different environment of vol crush, vol spike, vol crush, chop, etc. It, it was a pretty exciting yeah. time in October. Yeah, October was like one month that felt like one year, right? You, 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 we went through three major regime, regimes in, in 21 days, right? 21 market days, uh, market month. So yeah, that was exactly it. It was, uh, if, you, if I had to describe the feeling, it was just being whipsawed. Right, and it's it, it vol was crushing, and so we're we're trying to make turn profits, and we are profiting to 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 pay for that headwind, uh, and then comes the spike, and we make a little bit of money, but then it gives it all back in the next seven days or whatever. I don't remember exactly, but you know, short ter- shortly thereafter, that spike is totally gone, and it's back down, crushing again, and and so you give back what you just made. Um, now, nor- in normal environments, we are able to trade that. What I'd call that is volavol, and what volavol is is the the volatility of volatility, of course, as it sounds. But the, the way to think about it in simpler terms, a lot of people track the VIX index as an index of volatility, right? It's the uh, near-term uh, at the, uh, at, uh, volatility of the, of the S&P. So if you, if you think about um, the VIX and the way it moves, VIX doesn't just sit every day at, at one level, it moves up and down. So the variance of VIX would be, quote, volatile, right? As, as, a, as a proxy of that. So in, in October, that was an incredibly high volavol month. And so if you asked us, typically, are you guys good at volavol? We, we would say, yes, we are. Uh, the difference is it's not often squeezed into a single month where, there, where there's such extremes over a 21-day period, a, a peak and a trough of those magnitudes. So we like volavol. We like the variance of volatility because we're trading volatility. If I can buy volatility low and sell it higher, and then it traces back down, and I can buy some back and then sell it higher again, I'm swing trading the variance of volatility, right? So I like that because I, I want it to move so we can trade it. 
But if it does it also rapidly, you, it tends to throw your neck back and forth, right? Where you get quote whipsawed, uh, and it's just it, I say I, I guess the summary is it was too quick for us to handle. Not that you know it, it, there's, there shouldn't be such a thing. Like if you if you can trade, you can trade, but it, it is it isn't always that simple. Uh, and if you said to me, well, are you going to update your models to handle handle that 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 quicker whipsawing or that um, um, more more tight windowed volleyball? My answer would be, I don't know if that's going to be the way things are. I, I would say that that might have been a result of a upcoming election. So for something that happens once every four years, should we adjust all the models? Probably not, right? Uh, but it's yeah, so it's something we look into. But um, I, I would rather exchange being good at the normal volatility of volatility rather than um, fitting our models to what happened just once and what seems like a more rare occurrence that you'd see such extremes within a single month. And then moving into n November in that first week, you know, we I, I almost wanted to say the uh, the election event was kind of eventless, even though it didn't settle right away. But I guess it wasn't as volatile as people expected. So we started to kind of see that roll off in volatility. So, you know, everybody's excited to just kind of put that in the rear view mirror and get back to trading markets. But then we have this um, vaccine announcement by Pfizer, which creates this violent rotation uh, from momentum to value. And we haven't seen uh, that big of a move from momentum to value since like the early 1980s. And what, what's even more particular to talk to you a bit, little bit about this is, you know, you guys trade both, you know, puts and calls. You know, you have that straddle um, on the S&P, but you you may diversify some of your S&P calls to single names and, and maybe get the most bang for your buck in a, in a more momentum strategy on those single names. So, you know, you would hope that, you know, when the market spikes on a, on a vaccine announcement from Pfizer, you're going to make a lot of money on that call side. But if you're long calls and momentum, and it's actually a momentum to value rotation spike, um, you can kind of get caught on the other side in that unique scenario. Yeah, and that's a it's a nice summary of that of what happened. And you used the your first word there was the violent rotation. I think violent is an understatement, right? I, I that was that was total and utter destruction on that day. Uh, and to put that in mathematical terms, uh, it was one of the it was the most extreme outlier we've seen in, in, in decades, right? And not just that, since my time in the markets in 25 years, I've been in the markets. Um, but even before that, looking at historical data, it, it I, this is just so extreme to give you the numbers like value had a upside of about 8% and momentum and a correction of about 15. Um, I mean, between the two, it, it, that that, that that extent of an outlier where one could value could be up so much and momentum down so much uh, on the same day um, was, you know, some, some popular magazines or, or financial uh, uh, publications called it a, I think a 25 Sigma event, right? So, I mean, that, that's, that's a ridiculous way to think about it. Not ridiculous. It's a way to think about it. It's, it's that 25 standard deviations assumes a normal distribution. We all know that the markets are not normally distributed. So it's a, certainly a fat tail event. The point of all that is that it, it was so, extreme. It's never happened before. And of course, in markets, people are saying, well, that's never happened before. Yeah, that's true. And and, and we expect things that aren't haven't happened before, but it still happens, right? Meaning what hasn't happened before will happen and it happened to happen on November 11th. So, and we were there. So, therefore, what did that mean? Um, back to your, your, the second part of your question, which is how it affected our portfolio. Yes, we're in the S&P. We're in a straddle. So, we own both upside convexity and downside convexity on the S&P. And we, we trade it back and forth every day to, to, to create some, uh, some trading or we call it scalping to make profits to, to pay for this optionality. The other thing we do, we have various models in our portfolio. One of them has a long bias to momentum where we pick momentum ish stocks uh, that have this tendency where the characteristics of momentum fit very well or very synergistic to optionality, right? Momentum has a tendency to take off, to skyrocket, to be what I'll say is convex um, at, at times. And an option, a call option is convex. It, it can accelerate very quickly. That's the beauty of a call option. So putting a call option on a momentum name, let's say like Netflix or Tesla, you know, it, it's like putting a, an option on an option, right? It's, it's, you're, you're getting a double whammy for your, for, if you're right in the direction and over, over a time window, right? If you, if you knew that Tesla was going to be up 20%, next month, you buy call options. You don't buy the stock, right? And you'll make much more than that 20. So, we understand this characteristic and we understand not just is there more money to be made in, 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 in optionality on momentum, but there's also better downside protection. You're, 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 you've mitigated the downside because at the end of the day, you've just spent a premium. You've just bought an option for a dollar. So, the most you can lose is that dollar and that dollar is a, 
fixed part of your portfolio, let's say 1% of your portfolio. So these, these, these are the nice characteristics of momentum investing that fit toward call optionality. So with that in mind, we have a portion of our book, of our portfolio, that buys call options on specific names that we select using one of our, our models that has a very momentumish tilt. Therefore, on coming into that day, and not just coming into that day, but for years on out, that's what we've done. That's what we always do. That's what we believe. That's part of our core thesis is this momentum tilt or momentum bias. So we those on that day, momentum cracks. So all of those names, that basket is down, and that's a lot of our call upside. And then on the on the on the on the long put side where we're short the S and P, that's S and P skyrocketing because all the value side of it is skyrocketing. So our short side is against us, and our long side is against us, and so we completely lose in both directions, right? It, it is literally the worst of worst events that could have happened to us was on the announcement of the of the uh, vaccine. And what's funny is we thought the big event was going to be the, the election, right? And we are very well hedged coming into the election, very straddled. And we're like, okay, we don't know what's going to happen here. Let's just keep it very tight. Um, and then, you know, the, the election comes and goes and it was almost a non-event. I'm like, oh, okay, we're good. We're out of it. And then the next day, Pfizer, boom, like we're going to, you know, the f- vaccine is going to save the world. Fantastic. But now, of course, the airlines and the oil stocks and everything that's been completely decimated over months is now up huge. And of course, all the, the Netflixes and, and, and momentum names of the world are, are, are cracking. So, or kind of the, the end of the, the pandemic run uh, that, they all, that they all had. So yes, that was a, a horrible day for us. And when I say horrible, it hit us for just under 2%, about 1.7%, somewhere around there um, on the day. And that was one of the worst days we've ever had in the history of, of, of what we do. And it's, you know, that's, it, it, on, on the one hand, it was incredibly painful. But on the other hand, I looked at it and said, you know what? That was literally the worst possible chain of current <laughs> things that I like. Every coin I flipped landed on the on the on the on, the, on tails, right? And I, I called heads for all of them, and so it was the the biggest chain of wrong things. And yet we were down less than two percent, you know. And so we ended the month about down too. But for me, it was kind of comforting to know that if everything went wrong. In, in the most extreme way, this is still kind of where we'd end up, um, where so we can, it was happy to know that we can mitigate our drawdown when the regime for us is so out of favor, when our momentum longs are getting decimated and our shorts are, are spiking the other way. Um, th- this, this is the extreme of what we'd expect. And so, yeah, I mean, it's good and bad. I'm not, I never like to lose money, of course. That's, that's not what any of us want to do. But given the context and given the circumstances, uh, it was a healthy um, for us, we felt that our portfolio um, absorbed it well. And so we were happy to go forward and now hopefully come into a better regime. Yeah, not to extend our metaphor too much when we're talking about this, the headwinds of being a long volatility manager in general. But I guess when you're peeing into the wind, you're you're extremely careful. And so right. that, that, careful, exactly. that carefulness exactly. mitigated any downside loss, but it but it's also painful because in a spike like that, you would have hoped to capture some of that spike. So it's not only mitigating the loss, it's missing that spike. So it's painful all around, but like at the end of the day, it's survivable. And at the end of the day, that's what matters most is is survivorship. And so exactly. You know, this is a very uh, unique and, and definitely learning experience event for you guys in, in November. As we traveled into December, um, I almost want to say is it's kind of a return to normality in a way for all of us to catch our breaths a little bit and start to see, you know, vol drift back down, correlations start to come back in. Um, is that what you guys saw or did you see something differently? Yeah, that's what we saw. In fact, I mean, December, I mean, we were up a little bit in December and it was nice for us to be up a little bit because we, we you know, it, it it was just, hey, we're, the pain is done, right? It's we're we're out of the the worst of all possible times, and you know it was actually even more so nice because vol was still down and we were up, right? So we were still fighting some of that headwind, but the headwind w- was so much less than it had been over the prior months that at that point, a lot of our profit generating um, models we're able to not just cover the hurdle, but get above it. So now we're not just skimming the water where our heads are above water. And we're like, okay, good. And that, that is the first sign of the turnaround, um, not just in, in, in kind of quantitatively speaking, but just looking at a broad, broad picture, like the, the meltdown happened in February, March. Vol was peaked at 80, 90, 100 during that 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 period during the pandemic sell-off. And then, you know, it spent the kind of the rest of the year, the summer, decaying back down. And now we look at it, it's back down to close enough within one standard deviation, if you will, 
of the historical S and P volatility at sixteen percent a year. It's it's in the low twenties now. So it's that's it. We're 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 back. Like sure, it can trickle down to sixteen or fifteen, whatever. That that that's fine. But that's no longer the crush from from sixty to forty or forty to thirty. You know, those are just big moves happening at that point. Ten points rather than now we're in one or two points at a time. Um, so the the bear market in volatility is over. December was the first sign of a low enough headwind that now all of our profit centers can get us above water. And that's great. And again, we're experiencing it in January. We're up nicely this month again. Uh, Vol's been crushing a bit more, but again, at a lower magnitude, it's coming down in single points rather than giant chunks. And so our profit centers, once again, are able to turn up and, you know, we're up uh, at least nicer than we were in December. The month's not over, but it's at least, you know, as, as of today. So it, it looks like things are, quote, back to normal. And that's really exciting uh, because we just went through the, the, the toughest thing that our portfolio or our tendency to long vol can go through, which is a bear market in the thing we're long. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's, it's a nice relief and a nice getting back to normal. You know, you reference about like fall crushing back down to when, within a standard deviation of, of historical norms. I wonder how you think about like the perversity of like, we almost hope for vol to get crushed back down so we can reload on our long vol position, but I know. Can hurt yeah. as vol crushes back down. So how do you think about that? Yeah, it's it's funny. We're, yeah, we're, <laughs> can it get lower so we can wait for the next pandemic or which the next time won't be a pandemic. It'll be the new event, right? Uh, whatever that is in the world, there's always an event. Yeah. And and the thing is, obviously, February, March was extreme. S&P cracked 30% or so. Um, but just in the years prior, I mean, it was only a, a year and change before December of 18, S&P fell 14%. You know, in January of 16, it fell 12%. In August of 15, it fell 11%, right? This, these, these falls happen, right? That's the market. Uh, it doesn't take a pandemic. It Sometimes it just takes, hey, it's overvalued. It's getting frothy up here. Let's correct 10 to 15, right? So we always know that something's about to come. Either it's just the natural uh, market shaking itself out, profit taking, or it's some new event. I don't know. There's something happens in the world that just, you know we none of us saw coming, just like we didn't in in uh, of course in February. And it you know it can be completely unrelated. So yeah, we we get excited because we can start not only making more money, but loading up on that inventory, right? Waiting for that right skew event to pay off. Waiting for that that event that's going to need our insurance all that insurance we own to pay handsomely. Uh, and so it's double exciting and it's almost weird because it's like, oh, things are great now. You know, we can, we can start to expect the crash, <laughs> but that's what we do. That's the world we live in. And kind of tying it all together is, um, of many things you've said is like, you know, you've been in the market for over 25 years and if, if anything, the market continually surprises you, right? And everybody talks about 2020 is a very unique uh, environment. We saw these things we've never seen before. And then in November, you saw this, um, you know, rotation for momentum of value we've never seen before. And it's always something we've never seen before. And, but that's the kind of point where you and I have meetings of our mind, meaning the minds is that, you know, the point of long volatility and buying, you know, straddles on the S&P is you're set up for uh, unusual events to happen that you couldn't predict. And that's the whole point is you're prepared for it no matter what happens. And you're not trying to predict what's going to happen in the markets. Like, for example, if I had told you, you know, years ago, you'd be running a long vol book and there'd be a storming of the capital and vol would have stayed flat. You wouldn't believe me either. So <laughs> the, good, the good news on that is it sounds like you're saying is that is what we're seeing, too, is that um, this return to normality allows us to to get strong positions and, and good inventory on the books. Um for whatever's going to happen in the markets and, and maintaining that long vol mandate, even when thankfully the headwinds have, have slowed down a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I, I still don't believe that there was a storming of the Capitol, although I see it all over the media. It's, it's I'm still absorbing that fact in, in, in our United States. Um, but no, I, yes, we, none of us, I mean, the extremes, that's the nature of the word outlier, right? It, it lies out of our frame of reference. It's an outlier because there's, you know, with, within our, I don't know, the, the width of what the eyes can see, that <laughs> they're over in the far left. They're in our blind spot or the far right, right? And, and so, Yes, you and I 
um, share this deeply on the philosoph- philosophical side is that uh, we we don't know. We n- everything's always what we what we haven't seen before, and there's going to be something next year that we haven't seen before. And it's not just in the markets; it's it's in life. Like I, my, you know, my my son just. Uh, did something the other day that I never thought he would do right? on, on the positive side, right? He, he achieved something. I'm like, wow, that's, that's great. You know, good job, kid. Uh, so th- it's life is just shockingly shocking, right? It surprises us on the downside, surprises us on, on the upside. And what we've learned is that we just can't know, right? And so instead of trying to find the certainty, it's rather to manage the uncertainty, and there is no better way to do that than long volatility. Why? Because a shock is always coming in some in some way or another, right? It's always going to be, oh my God, we've never seen this before. That that's by definition around the corner. And so, yes, we we manage long vol books, we build it up, and in, in our minds, as at Logica, the way to do it, of course, is with a straddle. Because not only do we not know what's coming. We don't know which direction it's coming. Will it be a fantastic event on the upside or a horrific event on the downside or somewhere in between? And so you kind of have to be on both sides like that. How else do you best manage the uncertainty? You can't just say, well, the uncertainty is definitely going to be in that direction. It's definitely going to be bad. Well, maybe it's incredibly good. Maybe the market gaps up 10% tomorrow on something that we none of us ever expected that Biden would do. Right. Um, you know, one of the funny things is, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's so many different stories I could tell and I can go on for too long and so I, I don't want to, but it's it's the the summary statement is that life is so surprising, and so how better but to position yourself in the markets to be wanting of surprise, right? And to be to be sitting waiting around, oh, when's it coming? When's it coming? Right? And to just make money along the way while you're waiting, but then have that 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 built-in system to really profit on that surprise. Uh, I mean, people call it anti-fragility and, you know, there's different words that are out, used out there for, for that positioning, but it's just philosophically a beautiful way to approach the world is no, I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't, I don't listen to the news. I don't listen to economists because I find on average that they don't know and they don't predict well. Um, I mean, I, I listen to the news, don't get me wrong. I, I want to know what's going on in the world, but I, for the, for the most part, I discount people's opinions on the future because, they tend to, on average, have no, nothing better than 50 50 uh, foresight so, or forecast. So that's it. Yeah, we, we share that. Well, I guess we, we optimistically or opportunistically look at the, the proverb, may you live in interesting times. And yes. That's, that's the way we enjoy it. Exactly. Wait, exactly. I want to thank you for our, uh, doing a little bit of a, a Q4 2020 review. Uh, we appreciate it and uh, just look forward to always continuing this conversation in the future. Yeah, likewise. Thank you very much, Jason. This is Jason Buck from Mutiny Fund, and I'm sitting down with Bastian Balesta of Deepfield Capital. We're going to do a Q4 2020 review to see how their their volatility arbitrage models um, did throughout the quarter, and then also specifically their ICA model, which is their intraday um, trading on the market indices around the globe. Uh, Bastian is joining us from Switzerland. How are you doing today, Bastian? Hi, Jason. Thank you very much for having us today. Um, good. Good. It's a cold, cold and a little bit snowy day in Switzerland. And previously, we were talking about the uh, the different strains of COVID and, and how the different countries are responding. Um, so we'll leave that for another discussion. But let's go back to you know October, November, December of this last year of 2020. Um, and would you like to start maybe with the volatility arbitrage models or the ICA model, or or potentially just you know how how your firm was um, reacting and responding during Q4 2020? Sure. Yeah. Um, probably start with an overview um, across uh, the entire, entire, entire range of models, and then we can dive a bit deeper on the one or other. Um, Q4, Q4 has been quite um, the opposite to what we have seen in, in, in the previous quarter. Specifically, you can even divide the year in the first half of the, in the second half of the year. Um, the um, Q4 environment, um, of course, was centered around um, the election in November. Um, and um, the volatility um, um, space uh, was rather difficult and uh, um, uh, challenging to navigate in comparison uh, to a very obvious um, case we had in Q1 uh, and in Q2, uh, where we had the massive sell-off in markets and volatility was rising substantially. And obviously, all we do is uh, we have uh, um, various strategies, which are all long wall and strive in, in higher wall environments. And... 
Um, the they have different past dependencies. They deal with markets differently, but they they like they like the expansion of volatility and um, um, have done really well uh, in this um, sell off um, where markets uh, drop substantially. But um, the subsequent um, rally more than 70% in the S&P over nine months um, was something special. And um, it it went to a completely different degree in, in, in Q4. Um, one can probably summarize that um, what what started with COVID and uh, in in March, February, March, and subsequently the monetary and fiscal reactions to it resulted in market moves um, specifically in the equity side, uh, which we haven't seen in history before. So history was written um, throughout the entire year, continues to be at the moment. And um, um, Q4, um, with an um, extension of that equity market rally, um, um, is a reflection of that, um, where the S&P added another um, 11%, um, um, but at the same time got shaken around quite a bit um, first um, in October, and then had this massive rally after after the election. Um, if we look at the d different um, programs, the uh, Interday Crisis Alpha program, which is also um, a central part of the um, um, Volop um, program as a third sub strategy, it focuses on um, Interday um, momentum moves in global equity indices. So it trades um, the Asian intraday session, it trades the European intraday session and the US. Um, the US intraday session, uh, which is uh, very often the center focus because everybody looks um, it, into the world of finance through the lens of uh, US equity markets, um, has been dominated by um, um, some very some very specific pattern, which was very dominant in 2020, and it's not really um, reflective of what could, one could observe historically. And that was that uh, the, ma the majority of action in U.S. equity markets actually took place overnight. This goes for the sell-off in Q1, where um, the equity markets um, um, had the entire sell-off basically overnight. Um, the um, S&P was actually positive in March. And it also goes, if you chart that, if you differentiate between the day session and the night session, you see that the, the uh, massive rally, the 71% up in the following uh, nine months after the sell-off, were driven by the overnight um, and um, took uh, it on complete, um, uh, or entered an even higher level in terms of degree and magnitude um, in, in, in November. As such, that was rather challenging for us um, with the um, intraday momentum trading in the US, because <clears throat> if the action takes place overnight, um, the environment presented in the US is difficult. The good thing is that this program has evolved into a global program, and we had um, um, a lot of success in trading the European intraday session. Um, throughout this entire period. If one looks at the data, um, um, not just in Q4, but um, um, over the entire 2020, um, the US intraday session was actually the weakest out of 20 years of data. Um, this goes for simulated research as well as our live trading. But at the other, on the other side of the spectrum, the European intraday session was actually um, the best um, trading result um, out of um, the same period of data. So it shows that markets from time to time <clears throat> move in, 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 in cycles in that um, in 2020, there was a, a dominant feature that um, um, the U.S. didn't really move substantially um, in a momentum, in momentum characteristics intraday, but had a more mean reverting and choppy pattern intraday. And um, on the other side, in Europe, um, stronger momentum moves were current. And... We benefited from that quite substantially um, in Q1, 2, and 3. In, in Q4, um, in October, um, we got hurt a bit more than usually um, um, on the S&P in the U.S. intraday session um, on the long side of things. So while all we do is basically uncorrelated, um, so um, our focus is to provide uncorrelated, um, um, positively skewed returns across all these different programs, we were very uncorrelated in, in the first half of the year, providing 
um, positive returns in times of crisis, not only during the sell-off, but also in the subsequent um, contraction of volatility in Q2 and Q3. But in Q4, when the equity markets were even rallying further, we started um, a drawdown on the um, um, US and intraday side. And that was also uncorrelated. So um, a lot of our investors basically have equity beater on their core and then have um, um, have um, uh, various of these programs as an overlay or um, as, as you use us uh, in, in your portfolio, we have a specific function to deliver certain returns in, cer in certain circumstances. And um, we are a bit relieved from that um, role uh, when the overall market is going upward. But ultimately, we are also absolute return. So um, um, we would also like to strive in such an environment. But it was quite clear that we had difficulties in, in October um, specifically on the long side. Um, if we dive a bit deeper in October, the, the equity market actually went up um, in, in October initially um, until um, the late last trading week. And in the last trading week, it had a larger sell-off. And that's when we actually kept it, these moves as well. So we delivered in line with the profile. Um, we lost um, uh, initially when the market was moving upwards on the long side. Um, but had um, very um, attractive, positive return capture when the market was selling off towards the end of the months. But ultimately, it was still a very difficult, difficult environment. And that has been the narrative for Q4 for us, that um, the intraday um, program trading U.S. equities has been the driver of a drawdown, which started in October um, on the long side, um, being softened by um, sizable returns on the short side toward the end of the months when the market sold off. But but it continued into November, where we had um, another down day, basically, um, on the interday momentum side, and um, a little bit also in, in December. And that, that has been the key, key driver um, um, of the difficulties as a result of what we experienced um, um, in the U.S. interday session. And um, the, the interday sessions in Asia, Europe, and the U.S. are usually uncorrelated. Um, so if you if you look at the correlation between equity markets from a close to close basis, they have um, rising correlations, um, um, have seen rising correlations over the last 20 years because of globalization, interdependencies. But um, the um, open to close session, the interday sessions are actually not correlated. And um, a program like the Interday Crisis Alpha program benefits from that because you access uncorrelated return streams. But sometimes, um, these um, um, anti-correlation, the desirable anti-correlation or uncorrelated return streams um, um, uh, break down for a short period of time. That means that you can have joint losses in the US session and maybe also in Asia, or um, the positive contribution which you may have had from the European intraday session may not follow through in, in, in a period where you have now difficulties in US intraday session. And that, that, what was, that was the case um, in that period. So the European intraday session was very strong throughout the year. Um, it had positive returns um, in 11 out of 12 months, but it had a down month in November, for example. And as such, um, the drawdown, which started on the U.S. side in October, then continued with, a, with an another uh, down day, basically, in, in November, now driven by the European intraday session. And these things can happen. So you have periods of joint strengths such as um, in June, where we had our largest trading day, uh, where we captured um, 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 sizable returns in a global relay race in Asia and then later on in Europe and then in the US on one day. This is a perfect scenario where you can benefit from these uncorrelated returns. Um, and at the same time, it can, can happen that um, um, these things break down or um, you don't get support from any specific strategy counterbalancing difficulties of another. And that has been the dominant feature um, for the Interday Crisis Alpha program and as such had an impact on the, um, on the um, systematic volatility arbitrage as well. So the, the drawdown we, we observed during that period was predominantly coming from um, the US Interday session um, in the uh, Interday Crisis Alpha program. And so part of that, I just want to highlight a few things that you said. Uh, one is if those down moves uh, we've seen this year are coming in the overnight session in the U.S., um, you don't quite have the liquidity to trade there with the with the algorithms you use. For, for most people, it's not a very liquid market overnight. So therefore, you use you know Europe and Asia as kind of a proxy. But as you alluded to, you know they can be uncorrelated. So it's not a perfect proxy. Is that kind of how you view trading You know if the down moves are happening overnight in the U.S.? 
And it's it's yet yeah, that's that's a very fair point. Um, uh, it is it is like a proxy, and at the same time. Um, the liquidity is substantially higher in the specific geography, usually. It can be in times of crisis, in times of larger move, liquidity can rise also in the U.S. overnight session. But ultimately, um, trading trading market moves in Asia um, during U.S. Um, early night hours or in Europe during um, U.S. late night hours um, has been substantially more stable with higher liquidity and uh, usually capture these moves. But it can be that um, moves in the US are more insulated, that they are US specific, and they do not necessarily play out as dominantly in the other geographies. So it is it, it is um, historically and over a longer time, research suggests it is, it is more stable and beneficial to trade uh, the individual um, geographies and um, rather abstain from the um, um, overnight sessions, the Klobik session in, in the S&P, for example. However, um, that does not mean that such an environment doesn't provide um, opportunities uh, because there, there was still action taking place intraday. Even when the majority of the move was coming from the overnight, we still had moves intraday. And um, the, the last year, um, um, in t the entire last year, but Q4 as well, um, uh, very specifically provided us a lot of new and interesting data to learn and um, uh, further develop um, um, and the programs, uh, not only the ones trading at the moment, but also to um, support research initiatives. Um, one of um, the most important ones was that um, after the sell-off in March, um, where overall the programs did really, really well, we provided um, high uncorrelated returns and delivered in line with the objective, what our investors expected from us to protect the portfolio in times of crisis, considering that all the other asset classes sold off. So everything went down, even safe haven assets like gold and treasuries. And that's that's quite valuable when at that point of time, you can actually deliver positive uncorrelated returns. But at the same time, looking a bit deeper, we saw a key driver of these returns were the relative value strategies. So the calendar spread and the um, intermarket spread. And at the same time, um, in the intraday sessions, it was the uh, Asian and the European intraday session, um, predominantly, as said earlier, the European intraday session um, um, presented by the DAX, the strongest instrument last year. And the US was still moving a lot. So if, if you if we travel back in time and think about what happened really in March, we were st standing in front of the screens. There were a lot of large moves basically intraday, but our way of trading um, momentum intraday was not suited for that specific setting. Um, the moves, the moves were not the ones we would like to capture with the Interday Crisis Alpha program, but it triggered interest. Um, how can you trade and benefit from such things? And there were an, an, a couple of other data points uh, later on, also in Q4, um, where you had, you had, um, for example, a larger gap overnight. The market was gapping up substantially as, as in October, on the 1st of October, or 16th or 21st of October, sizable gaps. The market travels a bit further and then falls back and maybe travels the entire gap down again. And that's a quite a sizable move, but it's not a classical momentum move in terms of this is a long signal. And you, if you, if you change your perspective on such scenarios, you may find additional value. And that um, um, fueled a research initiative which started in March um, to basically look for what we call a sibling of ICA. Um, the um, active interday momentum program, it's the AIM program, um, which is um, shorter term, um, it, can, it can react quicker. It, the idea is that um, um, it is quicker in the market, writes um, vol moves, um, shorter vol moves quicker and does not necessarily need large magnitude moves on an intraday side. And um, we would not have developed that without the observations first in Q, uh, Q1, but then further pushed also on, on the live observation because we started live testing uh, this variation in Q4. And um, um, so while I agree that the, um, the setup presented that uh, the US markets were dominated by overnight moves, which historically has not been the case, if one looks at the largest sell-offs um, in the S&P since the birth of the dot-com bubble, they usually take place intraday. 
So the sell-off is intraday. And yes, um, um, a part of the recovery afterwards takes place overnight as well, but there's also substantial intraday momentum component to it. And that was not the case here in 2020. And that's why it's so important to have many past dependencies as you do in the mutiny fund that you do not only have, for example, this specific intraday approach trading US, uh, as we do it uh, in the program itself that we trade Europe, Asia and the US and the European intraday session has compensated the weakness of the US intraday session throughout that period in 2020. This also goes on a higher level, of course, on a portfolio construction level for the systematic voila, but also for the mutiny fund where you have these different past dependencies and you put another manager at the sideline who um, um, not at the sideline at the side of um, um, an US ICA program for example who may benefit from from exactly these specific patterns and um, may run into difficulties when um, it's ICA's US intraday session time to shine again and uh, that that's that's the overwhelming story of 2020, that we received a lot of data sets with um, a lot of um, positive news, um, how these programs um, navigated this um, historical environment with moves we haven't seen before, not just we as Deep Field Capital, but all, our, all of us. And um, at the same time, um, use these, this data and the learnings and these humble experiences of these huge moves um, to drive research further, to identify new opportunities, how to strengthen your existing programs or how to um, develop additional ones which can uh, trade side by side with the existing ones to um, be even better prepared next time around. So from that perspective, um, we we are quite grateful um, what, what we have learned. And um, the, uh, the AIM program, the Active Interday Momentum, um, has an even stronger long vol profile as as the way we have developed it. So it's it's even further further um, uh, down the overall objective we have to have this pronounced long vol profile to deliver positively skewed uncorrelated returns in times of crisis, but at the same time um, broadening the definition what a crisis is. Yeah, be 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 uh, be more flexible on that side of things, and we can see that, for example, in October, which is the key reason of the drawdown um, for ICA, um, with these three down days on the long side, and um, uh, being compensated by a positive capture, where we then kicked um, in and captured the downwards move towards the end of the month. Um, but AIM does deliver a different pass here, and AIM and ICA together um, have a stronger foothold even in such a setting. And um, um, as such, as humbling as it is, it is in a drawdown and as annoying it can be, uh, we are grateful that, generally speaking, the majority of investors, um, they have striven uh, or their portfolio has, has grown substantially based on their equity exposures. Um, if you put together the mutiny fund and equity as you have done in one of your share classes, um, they have the opportunity to benefit from, from the equity side of things and at the same time um, be protected in a scenario as in Q1. Though the, uh, not having a sell-off as deep and a drawdown as deep because you have long ball strategies which kick in and maybe even substantially if it's a real deep crisis. Um, and at the same time, then you have um, a, a market recovery afterwards. Um, um, you will always end up on a much better situation than just having the equities or um, just having long ball. Uh, um, so com combining it is always very helpful. And you can do that with different long ball strategies, but also, of course, classically with um, traditional asset classes and long ball on top of it. And as such, it has been um, a very mixed bag of stories in 2020. And we have been terribly busy, as busy as never before, probably, because um, um, a lot of very interesting um, um, data and very valuable data. Um, the same, the same goes for our trading on the on the equity side, which is um, um, has been um, not our key focus. Uh, we have an equity trading program, as you may remember, and uh, uh, an interesting data point is there: um, the Liquid Equity Alpha program that it has a ten-year track record. And it had its best year of trading last year. 
which also gives you an indication that something was different and special in this market environment. Um, it is, it's also an intraday program. It's a mean reverting program. So it captures something different. It, was, it's, it's, it has always been a decent program, but it had its best year last year. And at the same time, ICA had its most challenging in the US intraday session. And the European intraday session was uh, um, most profitable in 20 years. So there, there, there are a lot of historical terms um, how special this year has been. And um, we would probably even argue we're not out of the woods there. So um, it's, it's a, it's a con the year goes on. It is probably one of the longest years. Uh, that's always the running joke here in the team. It's such a long year. And we know that it's 2021 now, but it doesn't feel like it. It feels like a continuation of 2020. And um, as, as such, um, yeah, if we are really grateful um, um, that we have navigated it the way it, we have so far. And so it actually begs a, a much more philosophical question in that in two ways. One, when, you know, we're talking about Q4, but it's hard to talk about any sort of uh, temporal time frame in isolation, right? As you were alluding to, if we look at 2020 in general, ICA has done fantastic, right? But then if you look at it, it's getting into drawdowns into Q4, but no program is perfect and they're all going to experience drawdowns. So I'm just wondering, you know, at a, at a philosophical level, if you think about any sort of systematic momentum strategy, you're going to have to take those trades. And sometimes you're going to get stopped out and you're going to have losing trades. So you're going to go through drawdowns from time to time. So how do you assess, you know, is just this just one of those random processes where you're in a, a drawdown in Q4 of 2020? Or how do you then go, is, am I, is this a natural drawdown of a systematic process? Or are the markets different or the models broken? You know, that's a, that's a problem that's, uh, quite frankly, insoluble. But I'm curious how you guys think about solving that problem. Sure. Yeah, um, it's obviously always a concern of investors <clears throat> that something could be broken. Um, and obviously, um, one of the most important tasks of every systematic manager is to um, make sure to stay on top of things to understand where returns are coming from. That, that goes for the losses, but also for the positive returns. And um, you, you need to do um, in, uh, an analysis, of course, what kind of environment am I in? Is that an environment where a program should normally strive? That would be really concerning. So if you have um, very clear and obvious um, opportunities, which have historically led to positive returns, and now you don't deliver, or the other way around, um, now you have losses where you normally made money. And that's, that, that can be any indications that something um, has changed maybe in the market environment or um, that the, the, the model um, um, has, has, has weaknesses which need to be addressed. Um, the, this analysis needs to take place on an ongoing basis. And um, most, most managers um, in this space um, do, do a daily tra trade reconciliation to really understand every single trade and to reconcile what has happened here and what um, has uh, what kind of expectation did I have prior to that trade uh, for such a setting based on the simulations. And um, uh, that is one of the most important parts. Uh, the, there, there have been certain things which were, um, I wouldn't say departures, but temporary, temporary departures from historical norms, whatever norm is. For example, we have this very pronounced negative correlation between um, the VIX and the S&P. And um, a lot of modeling, not specific to our models, but in general, in the entire space, is built on that. And all of us know that temporarily, it can be different for shorter periods of time. It can be different. And there were some very pronounced departures, temporary departures from that relationship in Q4, uh, even starting in, in Q3 already. And um, um, a lot of narratives that are then built around that. Uh, one of the narratives um, was that we have um, um, new investors come moving into the space. Um, um, Robin Hood, Hoodlers now um, very aggressively being on um, the long side of things and implementing their trades via buying call options. And that had an impact that you had um, um, situations that the market was moving up and at the same time, volatility was moving up um, because um, you had now pressure, upside volatility uh, because of this massive call um, option buying. Um, um, a friend of us um, uh, at Logica, um, Wayne, I think he will be on the podcast as well, if I'm not mistaken. He has done a lot of research on that side of things and also um, referenced 
um, liquidity um, concerns, that the liquidity in the market has changed and that um, narratives such as a call option, Robin Hood and things like that are certainly um, valid points, but they, but they hide or um, 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 divide our attention from even more concerning aspects uh, in terms of how liquidity in markets has changed. And um, these, these things can have impacts on how um, programs can navigate market environments and um, um, are certainly um, an aspect um, which need to be taken into consideration for research. But ultimately, when we look at um, how the various programs of us have, um, have um, evolved or um, um, managed um, the environment of 2020, um, we haven't seen any indication that there's something broken. They, these are every single trade um, was a trade where we said this is a trade we wanted to take. Um, it can be that sometimes you say, well, the exposure was too small or the exposure was too large. Um, I would have loved to see that in, uh, uh, in, in a different fashion. And you can do an analysis um, um, how adaptive the exposure management takes place, if you can improve that, if there are new um, indications, um, if there are new data available, how to trade better. For example, the, the AIM a research project um, has built on ICA's proprietary qualifiers, but has um, an increased data set. So um, as part of that research process, we got additional data, we got an additional set of indicators. So the proprietary qualifiers pool has grown, which gives us a different picture um, on, on the market and on the quality of the momentum move taking place. Um, AIM uses, utilizes this set differently than ICA does, but still, um, it can be that um, these research projects and changes in market environment result in some very positive outcomes because you broaden your perspective and um, uh, you enrich your models by new data sets um, now available to make them even more robust. Um, but um, ultimately, um, Q4 has been, has been challenging on all kinds of different um, levels, but what has happened has also already happened in the past. So a departure from the negative correlation between the S&P and the VIX has taken place prior to that. So there are historical data points that this may occur. And um, um, uh, very often we have the narrative comparing um, the Robin Hoodlers and this call option buying um, um, to what we had um, at the dot-com um, area. And uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of parallels, but a lot of things are different as well. And um, so um, I would always be careful to, to make direct causal lines here uh, or links basically and uh, derive um, um, action items from that. But it's still important um, to review that. Um, momentum and intraday momentum um, um, is here is here to stay. It may disappear in the in the U.S. intraday session for a couple of weeks, for a couple of months. Um, the music may play somewhere else. It has played very loudly in Europe and um, in the U.S. overnight session, and um, uh, it is it is rather likely that this will change. Maybe um, Asia will be more stronger going forward, or the U.S. will be the next one where you have the action. Momentum is driven by um, something very deeply rooted. Um, in us as human beings, it is based on fear and panic on the on the on the short side, and it's based on um, euphoria, maybe, um, and excitement, uh, maybe greed, if you want to say it, on the long side as well. And these are very um, 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 strong behavioral patterns in us human beings, which are embedded in active trading. They're embedded in our investment behavior. They are embedded the way we. We not just we at deep field, but all of us. We also code our algorithms, and um, these things these things may be more pronounced in certain periods and are less pronounced. Or one side of the things, maybe the upside is more pronounced, um, but this only builds up the pressure um, um, for for the other side um, going forward. So from from that perspective. Um, um, I'm, we are quite positive that long wall, even when equity markets have been rising like hell since March, um, is, is a very valuable um, proposition. Um, um, people may be reminded um, in a not too distant future that it's very valuable to have uncorrelated strategies in your portfolio. Um, they, uh, an equity rally of more than 70% in nine months may make you forget that there can be difficult times. Uh, um, and the good thing is that the way Mutiny does manage the portfolio is that these long wall um, um, characteristics 
are not bought into the portfolio with with a high bleed, but actually the idea is even um, to make to make money in most market environments and um, manage manage um, the cost for having such such a portfolio uh, such a profile in the portfolio, and we do that as well with our strategies. And as such, um, while it may have been more difficult in Q4, um, uh, at the same time, um, this is a very short data set. Um, it has coincided with um, um, most investors' portfolios um, doing ph ph phenomenal well. And um, as such, I wouldn't be too concerned here, um, Jason. Um, there's a couple of things I want to touch on that, that you said there. One is, you know, everybody breaks down this dichotomy of fear and greed. I've actually argued it's fear, right? It's fear on both sides. It's fear of missing out on the other side. It's fear of our neighbor making more money than us. So I think greed is another form of fear, too, on both sides of that. So that's, that's the predominant human emotion, unfortunately. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, that's the interesting piece is that if you are, you know, if you look at correlations between the, the Volar models, you have to worry about correlations on that front. When you have, you said, you know, surprises like, you know, the rise of, of Robinhood call option buyers, which puts the market makers on the opposite side, which can accelerate prices. And there's always going to be something new in the market that surprises us that we haven't seen before. Yeah. And that is the point of having uh, an intraday momentum price action model is you don't need to, you're agnostic to what's coming in the future. You're not trying to predict that. It, that will reflect an intraday momentum and you'll try to capture those moves no matter what is new and what we haven't seen in the past. So you don't need to, you're not needed to adjust your models to, to, to any sort of fundamental past behavior. You're not fighting the last battle. You're just, you're going off today's, um, you know, price action and momentum on whatever's happening in the markets on, on that intraday session. So that's a very interesting piece, I think, to ICA that needs to be highlighted. Um, and then thinking about the volatility arb arbitrage models, whether it's the intermarket spread between S&P and VIX or the, or the VIX calendar spread is, you know, we had, you know, you keep talking about the uniqueness of 2020. We had a very unique Q4 in that we had this uh, echo of volatility from the March off. Mm -hmm. You had this very contentious presidential election, but that was also coming on the back of a surprise election of Donald Trump in the previous election. And so you had this huge bid up in volatility going to the election, which then created this this hump or kink or bump in the in the volatility curve as as VIX is a you know 30 day forward looking volatility that made a, a sharp contango and then sharp backwardation around this uh, around this vault around this election event which made it uh, incredibly difficult and there was no easy trades right for any sort of volatility arbitrage yeah and then subsequently after the election in going into November, December, we've seen this, you know, uh, implied volatility has been pinned in this low 20s, you know, kind of working around between 20 and 22. Meanwhile, realized volatility is crushed into the single digits again. And so th that makes it an exceedingly difficult environment for a lot of volatility arbitrage models. But um, across our managers, we've we've kind of been seeing, uh, as we've gotten in the last few weeks of December of 2020, and now we're moving into to January 21, are you seeing those correlations start to come back a little? Or how do you guys view what happened, you know, the, the unusual um, election event, followed by the crush and realized volatility, um, into what we're starting to see maybe a little bit of normalization again, or, or do you see it differently? Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. I, we would say... Um the, this oddly shaped, oddly shaped term structure with this bump around the election was certainly something um, um, we didn't scratch our heads and nor did our peers and friends in the space. Um, we have seen things like that before, but it's difficult to navigate. Um, that does not mean that it needs to result to losses. It is more. It is more that the opportunity set is rather weak, and um, it's uh, it's more it's more a question of how you navigate that. We have also seen that on the relative value side. Um, so if I look at Q4 on the relative value side, um, the um, um, relative value side was slightly positive uh, throughout the majority of the period, and we basically had one down day on the 21st of December, where um, um, there was a sudden change in the market environment, and um, um, the intraday momentum programs kicked in initially as as they are designed to protect basically um, you getting caught on the wrong foot on the RV side. Um, but the market reversed substantially um, intraday. So there was there was initially a downwards move, a very large downwards move um, in Europe and then also in the US, but it reversed. So um, and that results very often on the RV side that volatility may um, jump. 
on a day because the market sold off or started to sell off. And when the market then comes back within the session, um, volatility is a bit more sticky. It doesn't come down as quickly. So you can lose on, on the vol trade side, whereas um, your hedges may be um, a calendar months further out, which may not be as sensitive to the move, or your hedge, um, which may be the S&P, when the VIX, VIX was S&P. So your hedge was very had high open trade profit, but now the market is coming back again, um, being reflective of the choppiness of what we saw in the intraday sessions in the US. And as such, um, you lost on the wall, uh, on the wall side and um, your hedge basically weakened uh, throughout the day and you may end up with a loss. And that basically happened uh, on, on the 21st. Um, what we also saw uh, in, in Q4 is that you didn't have follow throughs. Um, so there was a single event, um, a movement, and you didn't really have follow through for two, three, four days. So if you positioned accordingly, is that you could benefit. Um, so the models, not just ours specifically, but I think around the space, um, um, had a challenging time to navigate, but that did not directly result in losses. In majority of cases, it was more like that you had not as much juicy opportunities. And we have seen that changing at the moment. Um, um, a lot of, a lot of um, um, the uncertainty was obviously around the election. And of course, it is the on and off discussion about another stimulus package. And um, it was further fueled, of course, uh, around the uncertainty um, if um, President-elect Biden back at the time will actually be the next president because he had challenges across the board. And that certainly provided some kind of uncertainty that people couldn't move on from that point. But ultimately, in the equity market, this was dri still driven by an equity rally uh, with more than 10% in the last two months. Yeah, so that side of things at least um, um, moved on on the perception of new stimulus. And um, we have seen a normalization in the term structure since then. Um, and we believe that the opportunity set on the relative value side has certainly improved and will further going forward. But um, um, at the same time, um, momentum um, um, will probably be stronger again because messages will become more clear either good or negative going forward, because you have a new administration in the US, there was a lot of hesitation if things happened before the inauguration or, or um, it took place yesterday now going forward. And um, uh, probably a lot of the noise associated with this, this period in Q4, and maybe if you zoom out, um, also noise around um, the previous administration um, where messaging was not always clear, um, um, it will fade away and something new will happen. I'm not saying it will all be easy and straight, uh, easy going forward, but at least in terms of the term structure, there's a normalization taking place at the moment and the opportunity set uh, becomes more clear, I would say. Perfect. I could obviously, I have a bunch more questions for you and I could keep talking to you forever, but I think we should leave it there. Um, I, I appreciate you coming on and, and giving your view of the markets in Q4 and your overview. I, I think it's going to be very helpful for our clients and always great talking to you. And I appreciate you coming on, Bastian. Thank you very much for having us again, Jason. It's always a pleasure. Um, stay safe and healthy and uh, all listeners as well. It, it will probably remain challenging for a certain period of time in terms of health issues. All, all good luck, healthy and a prosperous 2021, I would say. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, we'd appreciate it if you would share this show with friends and leave us a review on iTunes as it helps more listeners find the show and join our amazing community. To those of you who already shared or left a review, thank you very sincerely. It does mean a lot to us. If you'd like more information about Mutiny Fund, you can go to mutinyfund.com. For any thoughts on how we can improve the show or questions about anything we've talked about here on the podcast today, drop us a message via email. I'm taylor at mutinyfund.com and Jason is jason at mutinyfund.com. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at Taylor Pearson ME and Jason is at Jason Mutiny. To hear about new episodes or get our monthly newsletter with reading recommendations, sign up at mutinyfund.com newsletter.